All right, dear students, buckle up. This is going to be a longer podcast or screencast than normal um, because just quite honestly, section 8.5 is a really long section and I just didn't want to divide it up over two different screencasts because I was afraid that we would lose the continuity of the topic. So that's okay. We're just, you can, you can always watch, uh, watch and listen and speed me up to, to two times the speed. Um, so without further ado, let's just jump right in. Um, it may appear from the overall reactions that SN1 and SN2 mechanisms yield um, the same products. The nature of the reaction can yield subtle but important differences. And one possible, possible difference in the reaction products is their stereochemical configurations. The stereochemistry of an SN1 reaction differs from that of an SN2 reaction. And then the stereochemistry of an E1 reaction will differ from that of an E2 reaction. Um, so the stereochemistry of a reaction is going to describe of a reaction describes which stereoisomers are produced and the relative proportions of stereoisomers that are produced. So from this we know the stereochemistry and I'm going to abbreviate stereochemistry like this, of an S1 reaction is different from an SN2 reaction. And then the stereochemistry of an E1 reaction differs from an E2 reaction. And again, when we talk about stereochemistry, that just describes which stereoisomers are produced and then the relative amounts of the stereoisomers that are produced. Because sometimes we can get more of one than the other. So let's look at the stereochemistry of an SN2 reaction. Um, this is equation 818. It's going to show the outcome of an SN2 reaction between I minus an S1 chloro 1 phenyl ethane. Um, and this really helps us and illustrates the stereochemistry of SN2 reactions. When we look at this substrate, it's enantiomerically pure. It only has one enantiomer. Now, there are two possible enantiomers um, that, that you can have of the product, right? So you could have an R enantiomer of the product or an S enantiomer of the product. And these configurations differ around this new carbon iodine bond. But one, what we find is that the only one that we get is the R enantiomer. And so this observation can be generalized um, into kind of this overarching uh, theme, which is an SN2 reaction results in the inversion of the stereochemical configuration at the carbon initially attached to the leaving group. Okay, and I'm gonna uh, abbreviate leaving group as LG there. So when we talk about, um, what we're really saying here is look, if you have something that's enantiomerically pure and you've got a chiral center here, it goes through an SN2 reaction at the chiral center and a new chiral center forms, it's gonna have the opposite stereochemistry. Um, now, the precise stereoisomers that are produced depend on the exact stereoisomer that reacts. Um, and so then what we can say is that an SN2 reaction is stereospecific. Okay, and so that's the term that we use to describe this. Now, the burning question in our heart is why? It's my favorite question. Why should SN2 reactions be stereospecific in this way? Well, in an SN2 reaction, the nucleophile attacks the substrate exclusively from the side opposite the leaving group. 
So when this guy comes in, it's going to attack. He's going to attack on the opposite side. This is called a backside attack. Now, so let's put some words to that. Um, the nucleophile attacks the substrate exclusively from the side opposite the leaving group. Okay. Um, and so this is equation 819. And you can see this shown. The iodine comes down here and it attacks this carbon. It attacks that carbon because it's partially positive and it bumps the, cl the chlorine off. When it does, these groups move and kind of pop up this way. They become flat or planar, and you can see that it's kind of planar here. And so then when the iodine attaches here, all these groups are now on the other side. Very similar to when an umbrella um, gets blown by a big wind and pops out, okay? Now, this is known as a Walden inversion um, as well. So people can call it a backside attack or a Walden inversion. You can hear it um, responded to as both, both ways. Well, the burning question in my heart is, okay, yeah, okay, you have, this is a backside attack, right? Because it's coming from the opposite side of the chlorine. Why wouldn't it be a front side attack? Well, or how do we know it's not a front side attack? Well, in a front side attack, the three groups... would remain on the same side in the products. And so we know that a front side attack doesn't happen um, because they, those three groups move to the opposite side. Now, this is in part due to steric hindrance because when we think about this iodine coming in iodine and chlorine are larger groups right and so it's going to be there are smaller groups here with this hydrogen on this other side um, and so that's the steric hindrance part but it's also part charge repulsion Right? Because if you look, if this intermediate were to form, the chlorine and the iodine would be really close to each other, and both of those have a partial negative charge, and negatives repel each other. So it's much more advantageous for the iodine to attack from the back side because it gives it a lot of separation in those partially negative charges. So we know that a front side attack does not occur because of the stereochemistry um, that we see. Now, talk a little bit more about steric hindrance. Um, I, I like to show it this way. I think it just looks a little bit better. Um, the leaving group is often large, right? Otherwise, it couldn't accommodate such a big negative charge when it leaves. So it would crash into any nucleophile that approaches from this front side. Again, it's so much easier to see that here than on the previous slide. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, we would also see significant charge repulsions um, because the atom of the leaving group bonded to the substrate is really highly electronegative, so it usually bears a significant partial negative charge. Now, in a backside attack, which is shown here, the nucleophile is attracted to the partial positive charge on the carbon. So where we would be repulsed here and have steric issues, the negative is here, right? It's, it's partially negative, it's really big, and that's gonna make that carbon partially positive. So the iodine is attracted to it. And so that's one of the reasons we also see a backside attack. So let's do an example problem. 
draw the complete detailed mechanism for the following reaction, assuming that it takes place by an SN2 mechanism. Pay attention to the stereochemistry. So let's talk a little bit about the questions you should ask yourself. The first thing you need to do is you need to identify the nucleophile and then the leaving group. So when we come here and look, um, HS here is carrying a negative charge. So it's very electron rich and that's gonna be our nucleophile. So we know that's gonna do the attacking. Then we need to identify what our leaving group's gonna be. And to do that, we need to look and see, of course, which, which group would leave. Any of your halogens are gonna be a huge flag as a leaving group because they're the weak base of a strong acid, so they're gonna be very stable. So bromine there is our leaving group. It's a large atom. It can accommodate that negative charge when it leaves for the substrate. The next thing you need to ask yourself are how many steps make up an SN2 mechanism? Um, an SN2 mechanism is, is, in, is in one elementary step, right? And then we need to think about our curved arrow notation, as well as how the nucleophile approaches the substrate and how that affects the stereochemistry. So when we come down here to draw the mechanism, there's the BR, there's the H. Now, this CH3 here, it does have stereochemistry, so there are two stereochemical centers here, but this is the only one that's attacked, so this is the only one that's going to change. So, when these electrons come down and attack that bromine, going to bump that bromine off and those electrons are going to go up there. That is a one-step mechanism. Those are the curved arrows. Now, we need to follow our curved arrows to draw the products. When we look at this, this curved arrow shows us the new bond that's formed. So, that would be One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, good. For a second there, I thought I had drawn in an extra um, carbon. Okay, now we need to remember that the stereochemistry here is going to change. Where the bromine was on a wedge before, the HS is going to be on a dash. So we're gonna put the hydrogen in there, All right? and it attacks through the sulfur, and that sulfur keeps the hydrogen there. And then we have some electrons that are shown there. Then we also have to draw our leaving group, which is bromine minus. So there's our leaving group. Um, obviously we'll practice this more in class, but you do wanna practice drawing these um, because I think that just helps us with mechanisms. If an S1 reaction is carried out on a stereochemically pure substrate, um, like what we see here, right, that same S2-chloro-2-phenylbutane, then you get a mixture of R and S configurations. So unlike an SN2 reaction, SN1 reactions are not stereospecific. Um, and so what we see here is because, and we'll look at this in the mechanism in the next one, because the chlorine leaves and leaves a carbocation, the iodine here can attack either um, in front of or behind the carbon. So let's look at that here. So when we look at the mechanism, this chlorine leaves, that leaves us a carbocation intermediate. So the iodine can come in from in back or in front of this um, carbocation. And that's what leads us to having both the R and the S enantiomers. Now, this I think is a really helpful way for us to look at um, this, the symmetry here. 
this is really focused on the second step of the mechanism. Um, and it's showing the carbocation intermediate as a plane because this is trigonal planar, so it's going to be a flat plane. And then when the iodine is attracted to that positive side, it can do that from this side of the plane or this side of the plane. Um, and that, that leads us to either getting the R or the S enantiomers. So we can, we can kind of generalize this. If a chiral center is generated in an elementary step from an atom that's a not a chiral center initially, both R and S configurations will be produced. Um, and so, they will, let me think about what I want to say next. You might expect the enantiomeric products of the reaction to be produced in equal amounts. That's a racemic mixture. Um, and what we find, um, is that... This is the case, and so it kind of follows this general rule that if a new chiral center is produced in an elementary step, then the RNS configurations of the chiral centers are produced in equal amounts. And when they're produced in equal amounts, we call that a racemic mixture. If the reactants and the environment are a chiral. And so that's what we see here, right? There's, uh -huh. this is a chiral, okay? Um, we find that we get unequal amounts just generally if the reactants or the environment are chiral. And so unequal amounts are, like if they're unequal amounts of enantiomers, we refer to that as there being some enantiomeric excess. And we're gonna see that when we isolate limonene from lemons um, in the next semester. Okay. So one of the things that um, we see sometimes is that the nucleophile does not always attack that perfectly free carbocation in the SN1 reaction uh, like this one, right? Um, after the bond of the leaving group's broken in the first step, the leaving group does kind of hang around and remain associated with the side of the carbon where it was initially attached. And that forms an ion pair because there's an electrostatic interaction here. Now, the ion pair produced in the reaction is going to retain some of the chiral character from the original substrate when the nucleophile attacks. So effectively, this type of SN1 reaction behaves a little bit like an SN2 reaction, favoring the backside attack over the frontside attack. And so the result is a mixture that's close to racemic, but slightly favors the inversion uh, of a configuration. And so that's what we were talking about on the previous slide when I said, hey, look, sometimes you're going to get small unequal amounts if the reactants or the environment are chiral. Okay, and so we get a little bit of um, just a slight excess of one enantiomer over the other. Now, the stereochemistry in the next reaction that we're going to look at is a little more clear cut. Here, the initial substrate has two chiral centers, the carbon atom bonded to the chlorine leaving group and the carbon bonded to the OH. The stereochemical configuration of the carbon bonded to the OH is going to remain unchanged because there's no chemistry happening there. So just leave it alone. The carbon bonded to the chlorine is going to react to form both the R and the S enantiomers. Now, what we're going to then see is that these guys 
are going to be a mixture of diastereomers. Oh, it says it right there. I don't have to, got real excited, but forgot that it said it for you right there. So they're a mixture of diastereomers. Look, 2S, that's this OH. It's not going to change, but one is going to be S and one is going to be R. So we're going to have those diastereomers here. So the burning question in your heart is, both of these can be produced, but are they produced in equal amounts? And the answer to that is no. They're actually produced in unequal amounts. So the carbocation intermediate that's shown here, right? Um, sorry, I had to pause this for just a second. So let me let me <clears throat> let me go back. Um, the carbocation intermediate that's shown here has a single chiral center, so it is unambiguously chiral, and it also has no plane of symmetry. So it's showing there's no plane of symmetry here. Without that plane of symmetry, the nucleophile will be influenced differently depending on which side of the carbocation it approaches, right? So it can approach from this side or it can approach from this side. Um, when we look at this, the nucleophile would encounter um, the OH group if it approaches from this side, but not if it approaches from the left side. Um, so the likelihood of each approach would be unequal, right? And so the diastereomer products would be um, formed in unequal amounts, right? So there's going to be a little bit more repulsion here because this is a bigger group. Uh, there's a partial negative charge. Um, here, the iodine's not going to encounter the OH, so there's not as much repulsion and there's not as much steric hindrance. So you would probably get more of this one. Now, your book does say, <clears throat> verbatim, you may be tempted to try to predict which diastereomers produced in greater abundance. We caution against it. Um, and the reason that is, is because the factors that favor the production of one configuration over another are really subtle, and they involve the interplay between steric effects and electronic effects, like hydrogen bonding or inductive effects or polarizability. And so... It's, it's really outside the scope of the course. You may get to an advanced organic class where you talk about that a little bit more in depth eventually, like in graduate school, but we are not gonna, we're not gonna look at that. So we're gonna limit all of these discussions to reactions that are very, very, very straightforward, like this one. It's very straightforward. So let's look at an example. Okay. This says, draw the complete detailed mechanism for this reaction, assuming that it takes place by the SN1 mechanism. Will the reaction produce a single stereoisomer, or will it produce a mixture of stereoisomers? If a mixture, if it produces a mixture, will the isomers be produced in equal amounts? Okay. So, um, let's look at some questions that we need to ask ourselves. What acts as the nucleophile, and what best serves as the leaving group? Okay, this is our big old negative here, so that's going to be the nucleophile, okay? This guy right here, right, when he leaves is going to be the weak base of a strong acid, so he would be our leaving group. The next question is what are the steps of an SN1 reaction? How are those curved arrows drawn for each step? Now, we know the SN1 reaction takes place in two steps. And so let's look at that. So here's the BR. There's a CH3 right there. And there's an OCH3 right here. And the very first step is it's just the leaving group is going to leave. That's that first step. And when it does that, it's going to form a carbocation that's planar. Now at this step, we haven't talked about it yet, but I want it to be in your notes. You need to check for a carbocation rearrangement. Now we're not gonna have a carbocation rearrangement in this one because this is tertiary. And the only time you would have a rearrangement if you're going from something less stable to more stable. And we know that a tertiary carbocation is already very, very, very stable. 
if the we were to have a shift, then we would end up with a secondary carbocation, which is not a stable. Now, let's have the I iodine is going to approach. Okay, and it's going to attack. And I wish I had it approach from the other side because it just makes it easier for you to see. It's going to attack that carbon. Now, when it attacks that carbon, what we're going to find is that we are going to get two diastereomers here. One, two, three, four, five. I left out the OCH3 right there, so don't, don't be me. Put that in. Um, and so what we're going to see here is you're going to have an iodine here. All right. And then you're going to have an OCH3 here. And then you're also going to have an OCH3 here. Iodine. And then that guy there. Um, so we are going to end up um, having uh, two diastereomers that are produced here. Um, and so it does ask us, will these be produced in equal amounts? And so while that iodine nucleophile can attack from either side of the carbon plane, um, the carbocation is attacked, um, has a single chiral plane here, right? And it is chiral because we have this guy here. So what that means is these are going to be produced in unequal amounts. Okay. So that's chiral. And so we are going to get unequal amounts here. Right. Um, because we're going to have basically one side where you're going to have to deal with the CH3 and then one side where you're not. Um, particularly with this, this OCH3 there. Um, but again, we're not going to predict which one's going to be more. We're just going to say, look, you're going to get two diastereomers. It's an SN1. You're going to get two diastereomers. And there is the potential that it can be produced in unequal amounts. Now, let's talk about the stereochemistry of elimination reactions. Um, elimination reactions are going to form double bonds. So we don't have R and S with double bonds um, when we form. Instead, we're going to have E and Z configurations. So, in the E2 reaction that's shown here, um, there's a new carbon-carbon double bond that's formed, right? And so, like I mentioned, we can have um, both E or Z, but what we find is only the E isomer is produced. And so, then what we can say is that this is stereospecific. So, this E2 reaction is going to be stereospecific. Um, and so basically we have this general rule that E2 reactions are favored by the substrate conformation where the leaving group and the hydrogen atom that are eliminated are anti to each other. So um, when we look at this, um, it's easier to see it sometimes um, in a, a different conformation. So let's, let's look at it this way. Look at some Newman conformations here. Um, this rule is important for the reaction that we, we see um, because the carbon atoms to which the hydrogen and bromine are attached are connected by a carbon-carbon single bond that rotates rapidly. So basically, we have this carbon-carbon single bond, and it's just rotating super rapidly, right? And so we get those rotations, which we can see in the configurations here. And so we get anti and gauche, um, and then, of course, another gauche rotation here. Um, and those are the three stable conformations that are staggered, right? So these we're showing the three most stable, okay? Um, one of those conformations has the hydrogen and bromine anti to each other. That means they are on completely opposite sides. That's anti, hydrogen, and bromine. Um, and so,
when this happens, the hydrogen and the bromine and the two carbon atoms right here and right there that make up that single bond all are in the same plane. And so because they're all in the same plane, they are called anticoplanar um, or antiperiplanar. Now, these other two are gauche to each other, and so they, they are not, the, the hydrogen and the bromine then are not going to be in the same plane, okay? So, um, when these guys are in the same plane, or that anticoplanar conformation, the stereoisomer formed is determined by the location of the other substituents on the carbon atoms of the substrate, okay? So it's determined by where those other substituents are, okay? So when the hydrogen and bromine are on opposite sides, and we're showing that here in this way, these guys are anti each other, then all of these things here are in the same plane. Okay, now, so let's look at this <clears throat> with our fancy planar kind of imagery here. They're all in the same plane, which is represented by this kind of tan plane, where hydrogen is lined up with this plane, carbon, carbon, and bromine, right? And then the things that are sticking out that aren't in the plane are the hydrogen, the C6H5 group, the CH3, and the C6H5 group here. Um, now, notice that the hydrogen and the C6H5 group are together on one side of the plane, and then that means they are gonna be together, right, on the double bond, okay? And then the CH3 and C6H5 are together on the other side of the plane, and so they're together on the same side of the double bond. So an E2 reaction's favored when the substrate is in the anti-coplanar conformation. So we can, we can see that there. Now, once you see this, then you have to decide, is this E or Z? It's not always gonna form E and it's not always gonna form Z. It depends on where your substrates are. So, why is the E2 reaction favored um, by the anti-coplanar orientation of the substrate? Okay, that should be the main question in your heart is why. Well, one contribution comes from the electrostatic interactions and repulsions between the base and the substrate. Um, when the hydrogen and the leaving group are anti to each other, the negatively charged base is attracted to the positive, partial positive on the substrate. However, if the hydrogen and the leaving group are on the same side of the substrate, then the attacking base is gonna undergo a lot of charge repulsion from the partial negative charge on the leaving group. So there's some charge repulsion that happens here. Now, um, I want you to notice that the example that we looked at just had uh, one hydrogen. And so maybe the burning question in your heart is, hey, Dr. Pierce, what if you have two hydrogens on that carbon? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Um, if you have two hydrogens um, on the same carbon atom that can be eliminated, as shown here, then you get a mixture of diastereomers. So you get both the E and the Z formed. Um, now I want you to notice the E isomer is favored over the Z isomer, um, basically because of steric strain, um, right? So this, there's more repulsions here, there's more steric interactions. These big groups are on opposite sides, so that just means the E is the major product. Um, so we can kind of in generally say if an E2 reaction produces a mixture of E and Z diastereomers, the diastereomer that is favored will be the one produced with the more stable anticoplanar conformation. Um, and so in the anticoplanar conformation, 
it, that's going to lead to the Z isomer. Um, the two bulky groups that are gauched to each other. However, in the anti coplanar conformation that gives us the E isomer, those CH groups, CH3 groups are anti to each other. So that's when we say the anti conformation that leads to the E isomer is lower in energy and more abundant. Um, honestly, that's just a really fancy way of saying the more, the less steric hindrance you get, that's the more of your major product that you're going to get. So this has more steric hindrance. This one doesn't. These are anticoplanar from each other. Okay. Now, I, we always um, like to look at different, different ways to look at things. So these are two different um, anticoplanar conformers where the different hydrogens here, ooh, I thought I was pointing, I was not, the different hydrogens here and here are um, anti to the bromine atom. And these conformers are related by rotation again around that carbon-carbon single bond. Now, one of them is going to lead to the E configuration, whereas the other is going to lead to the Z configuration. Um, and so you can see that this is why we are going to get both of these being formed is because when you have two hydrogens on here, the rotation is so rapid that either hydrogen is going to pop up and be in that coplanar plane where we're going to see this reaction occur. So, so again, if you just have one hydrogen, you're just going to get one enantiomer. If you've got two or more, you can, um, I said one enantiomer, I meant one isomer. If you have two or more hydrogens, you are then going to get a mixture of the diastereomers, right? Now, let's look at E1 reactions. Okay, um, when an E1 reaction produces a new double bond, um, the stereochemistry is an issue if both the E and Z configurations around the double bond exist, right? And so we can get an E and Z configuration here. Um, an E1 reaction is going to produce a mixture of these, right? And so you're going to get a mixture. You're not going to produce one over the other. Um, you're just going to produce both. You may get major and minor products, again, because of some steric hindrance. That should be no, no surprise that this is the major product because we have these two big groups and there's a lot of steric hindrance right here. So um, to understand why both stereoisomers are produced, we turn um, and look at the mechanism. So the carbon-carbon bond in the product forms when the base um, is going to come in and pull off the proton from this carbon-carbon uh, hydrogen um, here. Now what happens is that's a single bond, so it's going to rotate rapidly and it's going to establish an equilibrium between just a variety of conformers. And unlike what we saw for the E2 reaction, there's no attached leaving group that places restrictions on when the base can attack. So each time the base attacks, as that single bond is rotating all around, remember these reactions are just going on. So um, we're rotating around and the base is going to attack and then we can rotate around this way and the base is going to attack. Um, either the E or the Z isomer can be produced um, depending on what that conformation tends to be. Now, again, the E isomer is favored over the Z isomer because of steric strain. And so um, those phenyl rings, again, are very, very bulky. So you have um, made it to the end of stereochemistry through SN2, SN1, E2, and E1 reactions. Um, what we will talk about in the next screencast is the reasonableness of a mechanism um, with proton transfers, and then we're going to kind of hone in on that carbocation rearrangement just a little bit more.